truth of the word in me. Let's go ahead and pray. I want to pray also for the funeral that's going on right now. I drove by the church. I don't know if any of y'all drive by the church on the way here. And um, it just touched my heart. Um, All these police cars and fire trucks. And if you don't know, there was a Johnstown policeman that drowned um, in in horse tooth, just out having fun with his wife and they don't even know what happened. And um, so anyhow, I just want to pray for that. And then we'll pray for the class. I thank you, Lord God, for today. And I ask you, Lord, I just feel your hand upon this funeral, Lord God. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you would woo, that you would use this as an opportunity to woo these men and women to you, Father. That, Holy Spirit, your anointing would be at res during this funeral and that you would call people in to the kingdom and they would say yes. That you would pull their hearts and they would not resist. Holy Spirit, go and soften their hearts. Soften their hearts, Holy Spirit, right now. Touch them. Move upon them. Oh, Lord, here we are, your daughters. We come, we come to hear your voice. We come to hear your word. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us today your word, your truth. Thank you, Lord. Bring us closer to you. Thank you, Jesus. We just, we lift our heads up, Lord God. We say you are good, you're kind, you're faithful to us. We receive of your grace, your mercy, your kindness. We believe you are who you say you are. We believe that you are for us. We believe, Lord God, that you're moving on our behalf. We thank you that you are a faithful father. We are your daughters. We hold your hand. We walk this life with you, Lord God. We walk this life with you, abiding in you, connected to you. We thank you for that right now, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Amen. So, I, I, uh, <laughs> as I was putting together this lesson, I felt like I was going like three different directions. And I think it's because sometimes you feel like you have to touch on this to get to this to get to this, you know. And because of that, because I felt that way, I felt like I was going to touch on some things a little bit, but then we're going to go back to them later on. Okay, and I'll let you know that when we're talking about something that we'll touch on a little bit, but later on we'll go into more depth on it. But I really wanted today, because today's just going to be different, because we're in a different environment, a different setting. We, you know, can't have our worship time-ish like we have been at the end and stuff. But I want you all to be really free to let's ask some questions Um, Because I'm going to touch on some stuff, and we're going to do this later on even more. I really felt like the Lord told me not to pick a fight. He literally said that to me. Don't pick a fight. But there's some things I want you to touch on that some women just need to get. We need to get straight in our brain about some things. There's some things that we've, we've lived through or we've heard or we've been taught a lot in our lives. And we need clarity to see things right. And if we're going to see the Lord rightly, it doesn't mean that we are figuring things out. We actually, that's what faith is, that we believe what he says, even when everything else just kind of looks like that doesn't, isn't quite the case. So I want you guys to ask questions and um, let's just go through some stuff that needs to be gone through. Um, So at the top, I I named this, of course, this is week three, but I named it Agreeing with God. And there's this thing about abiding, because that's that's our our class, right? We're going to abide in the vine that requires agreement. It requires us to agree. 
And a lot of times we think of agreement is I agree with you because I understand what you're saying and I feel the same way. But when we agree with God, it actually a lot of times is just a choice. We're like, I don't feel that. And it doesn't seem that. But I choose to agree with what you say, God. Um, Quote from A.W. Tozer, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. When we think about God, what comes into our mind? And it's going to tell a lot about what we believe him to be, who we believe him to be, and how much we are truly in agreement with his word and what he says. It's only when we view God right that we can truly abide in him. You know, we've read the verse and we'll read it again today. Jesus says, you need to abide in me. My words need to abide in you. This is important in our life. Well, if we're going to walk out in that, then we need to get our minds right about how we view God. And it is not something that we can be casual about. It's really, like, it's, it's, it's the top of the top of how we view God. And when we let wrong patterns of thinking stay and let old little phrases and things that we grew up with or things that we heard and made sense, when we let them stay, they actually rob from that ability to fully engage with the Lord. And so it, it's, it's a serious matter that we need to take to the Lord and get our heart right. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this just very briefly, and then later on we're going to talk about it more, is this matter of the Old Testament versus the New. Because that is actually where a lot of people get tripped up. And I'm going to be honest with y'all. I have not read the whole New Testament. Um, the in- what? Yeah, did I? What did I say? Oh, all, I've read the New many times. <laughs> I've never read all of the Old Testament. And I've tried really hard. Um, <laughs> I'm about halfway through it. Um, I decided, actually, this is just me because I'm kind of like a completer person. Like, I have a project. Let's get it done. So I actually started to pick out, like, the small books so I could just read them, like, in a whole thing and go, wow, did it. Got that one. Got, you know. And um, it is, it's just this struggle and it's hard and I'm like God I don't understand and it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like it's the same God the Old Testament God doesn't does anyone else feel this way okay and we're like what's up here and um uh so I'll talk to the Lord about that like what's up Lord I I you know but I know Malachi 3 6 it's in your notes for I, the Lord, do not change. Okay, I know that. I also know in James 1.17, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change. So literally, he's saying, every good thing comes down from me and I don't change. So I've been this way forever. I've been good forever. Um, 1 John 4.8, we read, God is love. And so, you know, I was just talking to the Lord about this and, and pulling from people that I know and love. Bill Johnson um, wrote a book not that long ago called God is Good. And he said this is actually the first book that the Lord ever gave him a mandate to write. That it wasn't like, hey, God, I'd like to write on this. And God's like, yeah, that's good. Do it. But literally, he was in a meeting and God said, you write a book on my goodness. And... Um, So when I read things like this, and I'm going to read a little portion out of this book today, um, it stirs me up in what I know to be true. Like, I know God's good. I know he's a good father. Do you all know that? We know that. But then we read things in the Old Testament. We see things, and we're like, I don't get it. Yeah. I always think, I mean, this might be just me, and I 
I don't know, it might be very carnal, but I think <laughs> <laughs> when I read the Old Testament, I feel like there's so much works in it. Yes. And it's like... Well, that's all it is. Yes. Yes. It yes. And it's like, that's why it's rubbing you raw. Yes. Yes. And so we see things and we're like, I don't get it. And the Lord, you know, has talked to me about everything he does is out of love. Everything he does. The Old Testament, he actually was functioning in love. And we'll talk about that more in the future. But one thing I want to get down with you guys is that we have got to settle right now that we know, no matter what we read in the Old Testament, and it's confusing, no matter what we experience in our life, no matter what we see others experience in their life that love God. This, this uh, police officer, uh, Wynn Therese, he was, I guess, just an unbelievably loving person, just ministered to people wherever he went. You know, and so people look at things and we try to go, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. And there's this thing where we got to settle. And I know you all have heard my mom say this many times. God's good, and the devil's bad. Amen. And we have to settle it. Amen. But not only do we need to settle that, we need to settle good means good. And bad does not mean good. That's right. Ever. <laughs> bad does not mean good. Because what we try to do is we try to start figuring things out, and we know for a fact that it says God will work all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We see the Lord. Like, I believe at this funeral, there are going to be many people saved. The Lord's going to turn this and bring in people into salvation. We know that. But we also have got to settle down. And in, in Bill Johnson's book, I don't know if I'm going to read any of that today, but he talks about, this goofy thing that we do in our mind where we start saying bad is good. And we start looking at things that are bad and we try to twist them around and say, well, no, they're really good. Why? Hmm? Why? I think that lots of times we do this because we want to be okay inside. And there's for some reason in our flesh is the need to know is the need to understand, is to need to know why. I'm not sure we're meaning making people. Excuse me? I said we're people that make meaning out of people. Yeah, we want to have meaning. And um, my uh, daughter, really two of her really uh, close, close friends, a brother and sister, a couple years ago, uh, the brother was driving with his cousin, two cousins and a couple friends, and there was a car accident. And one of his cousins died. And I remember Zolis, Christina's really good friend, coming over to our house and talking to me about it. And it was that needing to know why. Understand why. And it is such a struggle because we have to walk in like super mercy and grace and love and um we don't really, we don't need to know why. We don't need to come up with a reason why for people or for ourselves. We really don't. We've got to settle down and go, okay, God, I don't know why, but I know you're good. And I'm asking you to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the wounds. I'm asking you to, to um, bring out whatever you can bring out of this for your good. I'm asking you, Lord, to fix what in the natural cannot be fixed. And, um, and to settle that, that God is good. He's motivated by love with the purpose of man abiding with him. He's motivated by love. God is love. He's motivated by love. So we look, and we're going to talk about this in depth later on, about the difference between the old and the new. But this is the main difference, and this is the thing we have to understand. Jesus is the difference between the old and the new. 
Jesus going to the cross and paying the price for our punishment means no longer do we have to be punished. Jesus becoming the sacrifice for the sins of all for all times means no longer do we have to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice. We have to see the distinct difference that Jesus not only paid the price, but now God relates to man in a whole new way. He relates through the finished work of the cross. Through the sacrifice. So if we try to go back to, I, I was just in a prayer meeting the other day with somebody and I loved it. It's a verse that I'm going to uh, read later on. But she said, Lord, you said on the cross, it's finished. And then she says, if it's finished, that doesn't mean it's finished and we have to add something to it. Yes, See, when we do that, we're jumping back to the old. And we're thinking like the old and we're striving to earn and deserve and be good enough. So then it says, I think it's in Colossians, it says that you trample the blood of Jesus when you do that. When you try to add to it. And you've fallen away from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then what's important is that we do see though that we have to abide. In him. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so if you abide in me and my words abide in you, now isn't that doing? No, it's a relationship. It's connecting with what's been done. It's receiving what's been done. I can have a huge um, inheritance for my children. I can, have, I can have Thanksgiving dinner made. It's available to them. But they need to come and partake of it. That's their part. Isn't that crazy? Our part is receiving. Our part is abiding. Our part is connecting with him. That's what we're asked to do. And it's not even, and even that is not earning or deserving. That's just natural. You're, you're going to not abide. You're not going to be able to receive. I mean, you wouldn't think a vine was like being... Uh, unreasonable by saying to the branch, okay, if you stay connected with me, you'll be receiving everything I have for you and you're going to bear fruit. That wouldn't be a demand on the branch. That is just the way it works. That's the spiritual principle. So when we get confused so often, it's with looking at the Old Testament. That can really confuse people. It can also confuse people looking at situations in their own life, and I think that's probably even more so. I mean, even in my head, the, the, there's this tendency, I don't know if it's the enemy or, the, or my own tendency of the flesh, that you know I'll be praying uh, for a situation, and then all of a sudden a situation pops up where somebody else in their life, the opposite happened. Okay, like... Um, you know, a child went wayward and ended up dying in that situation. Or do you know what I'm saying? Somebody died of cancer. Or, you know, the, the end result was not what you knew that person was praying and believing for. And so our own mind wants to go, oh, well, if it happened to them, then it can happen to me. Instead of us stirring up that confidence and going, God, I know you're good. I know you're faithful. I know what your word says. That's what I'm going with, Lord, is what your word says. No matter what my situation looks the opposite, no matter what their situation looks the opposite, I have settled this one thing. God is good and he's for me. He's good and he's for me. Yeah. Yeah. God is good and his mercy endures forever. But when we say God is love and God is good, I think we need to define what the real definition of those two words are. Because mm -hmm. if we look at it from the flesh, it would be gooey. Love would be gooey and enabling. Mm -hmm. and all these things that we, all the mistakes we make in raising our, God doesn't make mistakes. No, he doesn't. And his love is perfect. So when yeah. he says God is love, 
I think we need to look at 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah. And realize it doesn't say you're going to have everything you want mm. just because you ask. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think sometimes we take our human emotions and feelings into those two words. Mm. God is good, but to us good would mean... Why would you let that person die of cancer? Why wasn't that healing there? Why so you, the, the why thing... You, I've heard people say, why didn't you stop me from doing that? Well, sure. that would be good, I guess, because we grab our child so they didn't run out of the car. Sure. But do you know what I'm saying? I think we have to define those So things. what's important is, is once we... So once we get this clear picture that, okay, if it's true that Jesus died for all, if it's true that he made a way, if it's true, if we believe that, then everything changes after the cross. Everything. And that's even kind of interesting when you're reading the New Testament. We're just going to like completely go off of notes today, I can tell, and that's okay. Um, but even when you read the, Old Te the, the New Testament, the Gospels, it still was before the cross. It was still before the cross. And when the little lady came to Jesus and he said, Son of David, she said, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is full of demons. And what did he say to her? It, it, it really has always bothered me. He's like, no, send her away. I came for, I came for the house of Israel. I'm like, what? What's going on here? What's interesting is, is that she cried out, Son of David. The only people that called Jesus Son of David were Jews. And she was not a Jew. She was actually pretending to be something she wasn't. And he called her on it. He's like, I came for the household of Israel. And then he calls her a dog. He's like, I don't, I don't give my food to the dogs. And you're going, Jesus, who, what, what is going on here? He is still has not gone to the cross. His call was to Israel. But then what's so great is she says, but even the dogs get the bread off the table. And he's like, oh, now she's coming to me. Her, her, she's having faith. She's extending her faith, not trying to pretend to be somebody else, but she's coming to Jesus. Jesus, here I am. Even the dogs get the bread. And then he moves on her behalf. And it's compassion. And so we see this heart of Jesus and we see how he moves. But we have to understand, and, and going back to what you were saying, the cross did it. And when we see the cross did it, Everything after the cross is what I look at. And when Jesus said that he came and he came to save all, that means he came to save all. And when Jesus said that he came to heal, to provide healing for all, he came to provide healing for all. And when things don't go as we'd like them to go, and we don't see people saved that we want to see saved, and we don't see healing come forth like we want to see healing come forth, we still have to go to the Word and we say, I still believe this, that this is what truth is. God is good. He is faithful. He has provided all that we need. There's nothing missing. There's nothing lacking. And like I said before, good is good. Good is good. We don't have to question what goodness means. I want to read a little bit here. And I really want you guys to ask about stuff here. I don't want to just read it. But that's interesting. I'm going to read this part just because of what we were just saying. So this is just into the book a tiny bit. And Bill Johnson starts to talk about um, he's a father. If we were to do, or, <clears throat> sorry, if I were to do to my children what many people think God does to theirs, I'd be arrested for child abuse. People say God is good, yet they credit him with causing cancer, natural disasters, and even blaming him for terrorist attacks. Some try to escape the pain with such shameful words and reasonings by stating he allowed it instead of that he caused it. 
jumping down because this is lengthy and I don't want to read it all. They also say God works in mysterious ways. That, you know, you know the verse that says his ways are higher than our ways? You know that verse? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the verse before it actually speaks of God's unbelievable mercy towards the sinner and how he draws the sinner with his mercy. And he says, because my ways are higher than your ways. We quote those things when we don't understand stuff, when in reality what, there's, what that verse is speaking on is the mercy and compassion of God. We need to be really careful about those things. Am I stepping on toes right now? Because I'm stepping on my own. I mean, I know that there's times where I'll let my brain go places where I'm like, Carrie, you know that's not true. And we have to really... so. Obviously, I liked these pages. I like highlight them. But we really need to pull ourselves in here. Um, there's a common thought that many that God uh, in many that God causes or allows evil to take place so He can dip- display His mercy. That would be like me breaking my child's arm to show my ability to give him comfort, and then using my skills to reset the broken bone. People ask me, what about Job? My response is, what about Jesus? It's so important, gals, that we don't fall into this reasoning of, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And what about that? What about Jesus? What about what Jesus did? I don't understand why things happen. I don't understand even when we seek the Lord and we... We push in and we want to know what he has to say and we walk out and what we feel is the answer and sometimes it just doesn't work out as it should. And we come back and we're like, yeah, but Jesus, Jesus made the way. He is the answer. There's no question that God can turn a situation around for his glory. Don't you all know that? Haven't you all seen that? I have seen that so many times. And for our benefit. This, of course, includes the most evil conditions known to humanity around the world. But that, him turning things around, that is a testimony of his greatness and his redemptive purpose. It does not represent his design. Because God can take something that's horrible and awful and turn it around, that doesn't mean that that was God's plan. It just shows how good he is. That in the middle of junk, he can cause beauty. Y'all are being really quiet. Well, number one, we live in a fallen world. Absolutely. Number two, we have choices. Everybody Everybody has a free will. We're not little puppets that God says you do this. You do that. You have to do this. We have choices. Yeah. We speak out our choices. Yeah. And they cause things to happen. Also, what's what's really good, the Lord taught me this, I don't know, about four or five years ago, that I don't have to know why, that I don't have to understand for my own life or somebody else's life. Right. Um, and the only place I'm allowed to go is if I have something happen, that I'll go, okay, Lord, if I miss something, I'm asking you to teach me and show me. That's good. But I don't need to know it for somebody else. And I don't need to figure out everybody else's deal. I can pray. You know, I pray for people. Lord, give them wisdom and revelation. Show them your will. But it's not my place to critique their life. It's not my place to wonder where the door was opened. It's not my place to figure out how to fix them. Even my kids. My own relationship with the Lord is I abide in him. He abides in me. Lord, what do you want to say to me on this matter? What a hard adjustment do I need to make? I don't need to abide for somebody else. It's a super, super big deal. We also have an enemy. The next thing, we have an enemy. What might be even more devastating is the view that God causes evil and that it ultimately compromises our 
ability. Listen to what he's saying. When we think that God causes evil, it compromises our ability to discern a demonic assault. We can't see the devil when we think everything is God. And you know what? Sometimes we need to take authority over the enemy, probably a lot more than we do. People constantly embrace health situations in their life because the thought that God intended it for good. The way of thinking infects the God-given ability to discern the works of the devil with a human reasoning that's demonic by nature, that we're reasoning things. I remember years, years, years ago um, in a Bible study class, uh, one of the gals said, I was always afraid that I would be assaulted because God wanted me to work with women who were assaulted. Like that was her plan. And God will use people, you know, the crap, the crap that has happened in my life. He's used me to speak into other people's lives. But no way was that in the design of God to have that happen so I could walk in this. Do you guys see that? And we need to be aware that we don't, we don't give agreement, that's what we're going to talk about, to those kind of thoughts and to those kind of things. Um, it, for, it causes us to forget the enemy and who we're fighting against. Jesus gave us all we needed to know. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's bad. That's bad. I came to give you life and life more abundantly. That's good. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's not complicated. Loss, death, destruction are the things left behind when the devil has an influence in a given situation. Jesus is the good shepherd. And what does that goodness look like? What's it defined as? He gives abundant life. Here it is, lost, death, and destruction versus abundant life. One is bad, the other is good. It shouldn't be hard to distinguish between the two. I like that. God is good. And we settle this. And I'll tell you what, if we have any problem with that, because I'm not saying I don't ever. I do. There's times I'm like, oh, what's going on? Or I want to understand I want to understand this. And lots of times, and, and I'm not saying that the Lord won't ever show us why, but lots of times what that does is it opens up a door for a lie to come in when we have to know why, when we have to understand. Does anyone have anything to say? Y'all are being so quiet. Yeah, Judy. Uh yeah yeah and I think that sometimes the reason we want to know why is because if we know why then we can come up we can kind of settle ourselves and feel okay or we can come up with a plan to fix the why right like you know if there's if there's I'm, I'm dealing with house stuff back in Kansas City and if there's a problem like uh, the air conditioner is running constantly or something like that I need to know why because if I know why, then I can fix the problem, right? So then we try to do that with life, that we know why. Why is, why is my son acting that way? Why is my daughter upset about that? Why is that, you know, why, is, why am I all in turmoil and everything? And so lots of times we want to know why so we can fix it. Instead of going to the God that's good, abundant life, and saying, God, I trust you. Show me what I need to know. And I believe what you said that you're finishing the work that you began. I believe what you said is true. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, the, the worst question, because we question when we can ask different questions, but the worst question we can ask is why. Hmm. Because the brain then goes out 
I yeah. mean, that's the way we're wired. Yeah. That's the way we're put together. Yeah. So the brain then goes out to try to figure out why. It's a very worse one. But when you frame it differently, what can I do differently? How can I see this? Like yeah. you're saying, Holy Spirit, where do I need to put my focus? Asking really good yeah. questions, the focus then becomes on that. Yeah. But the why is loaded. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And it is so important that, you know, we talked about that, talking to the Lord, asking him questions. Lord, what are you saying to me about this? Where is the adjustment in my heart that needs to be made? Lord, what, what's going on here that I'm questioning your goodness and your faithfulness? I don't want to do that. Show me. I was uh, getting in a lot of anxiety, and I'm like, Lord, I'm not going back into that. Show me what's going on here. And he showed me. He showed me where am I allowing my thought life to go? Where am I allowing, you know, what am I doing to, to fight that with the truth, to renew my mind? You know, all the things that we know to do, and it's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And then, okay, let's do that. Take my hand again. He gave me that picture this week. Take my hand again. Abide in me. Take my hand again. We drop his hand and sit down on the ground and, and throw a little tantrum tantrum. Or we drop his hand and we run ahead. Or we drop his hand and we go take a nap, right? And sit, no, Carrie, just come abide in me. Just trust me. Listen to me. Hold my hand. Julie. I love the Philippians scripture about not being anxious. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Say, don't be anxious about anything, yeah. unless it's a really big thing. But yeah. But what's wonderful is that he goes, <laughs> he goes through the, the list of things that we can do to not be anxious. To me, that's such a loving, compassionate verse because it, it, he's saying, don't be anxious, but do this. Yeah. Because I didn't make you to be anxious and carry all What is love. that? What's that? What is it, that? It's Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And so, I, to me, that's just kind of a red flag. If I'm being anxious, I am outside. Absolutely. Any me. kind of negative emotion is letting us know it's we're not right. abiding. Yeah. And. Um, but sometimes we can think that anxiousness is just a part of life. Oh, well, I'm gonna worry about this. Of course oh, no, it becomes, and, and what you said about, what, what Julie said about, unless, you know, well, yeah, I'm not anxious unless it's really big, you know, because then it means it has a little bit more power than God, right? 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 <laughs> so, so I was uh, praying the other day, and, and uh, I started to do this thing where I was agreeing with, we're going to get to agreement, it's, it's a big deal to God, um, but I was agreeing with the excuse. So what I mean by that is, well, this person has this struggle in their life because they were bullied and picked on and, um, you know, they had this hard um, thing where someone was super mean to them or, okay. And so then what we do is we come into agreement with the excuse Okay, so that has power in their life. And God's power, it's going to take a lot to overcome this. And don't we know, and I know right now I'm thinking, but yeah, that's real. That's real. There, there's some big things. I mean, like we were joking around last week about I still have some stuff that comes up in me when my phone rings from years of my phone ringing and lots of bad stuff was on the other end of the line. And so I can come into agreement with, well, that, yeah, that's just, be, I'm this way because of. And when I say that, you know what I'm doing, gals? I'm giving that thing power and a place in my life. Instead of saying, you know what? God, you're bigger than that. And your love is greater than that. And your peace is available to me even in that. That we we start seeing things right and we start agreeing with God instead of agreeing with our situation, instead of agreeing with our circumstance, instead of agreeing with whatever has been going on. Um, uh, John nineteen twenty eight through 30, it's where Jesus said, it is finished. 
that was where it all changed, gals. It all changed right there. No longer were we prone, no longer were we required to work, to sacrifice, to pay for our freedom. But it is finished. The punishment was paid. The sacrifice was made. And everything changed. Everything changed. I've been listening to these books on tape. They're fictional books, but they're set in the time of the Bible. And it's been very interesting to learn some stuff I didn't know um, about Nehemiah and uh, the, some of the different minor prophets and stuff. But as I'm listening, I'm listening through the, or I'm looking at it through the lenses of, oh, but that's changed. Oh, but that's changed. Wow, that's changed. God didn't change. The way he deals with his children, the way he interacts with his children changed because now all of a sudden we're able to abide with him. Not serve from far off, not earn, not deserve, but to abide with him. Do you guys get that? Yeah. Do y'all see that? We can know it, but we have to know it. Like we have to be like, nope, that's, that's the facts. Can you crack that door? Woo, baby! Oh, oh, okay. Wow, that was exciting. Okay. Woo! Uh, the way sin was dealt with ended at the cross. The sacrifice of animals was required under the Old Testament. That ended with the sacrifice of Jesus. When Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice on behalf of everyone for all times, he made it possible for everyone from all times to be put right with God. And we think of that and we go, yeah, yeah, I know that. No, it, it means everything changed. Do you guys see what I'm saying? It's a big deal. Yeah. Have you ever Thanks, read any Cheryl. Of the Torah? And don't quote me on this, but I think there's 630 different laws. Sacrifice yeah. laws oh. that they had to make. And even then, they never got perfect with God. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you've not ever read parts of the Torah, some of those sacrifices are. It, well, I should have it with you. Well, there's some there's stuff there, about like, like yeah. Throwing a chicken over your head and clipping your nails of your slaves and, 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 yeah, and mm -hmm. on and on and, and what weird things Jesus took care of. Yes. Awesome. Right? Well, Are we all be sitting here going this with our chickens? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so. So. So, anyways, um, that's good. So, they're going to turn off the heat? Awesome. And then we'll shut the door again. Judy. May I suggest that the Old Testament and its laws were there to show man that he could not do it on yes. his own. Yeah. It actually, it, it, it showed them the need of a savior. Absolutely. All right, we're going to move along. I want to talk about, um, I want to go to John 15, 1. I asked, so I guess you originally turned it to 76. Ooh, nice. So she should turn it down. That's now. awesome. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. That's great. 76. Um, um, John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. If, the, if, if Jesus says, I'm the true vine, that means there can be 
untrue vines. Okay? And I, I want to look at something here. Um, Jeremiah 2.13. It's on, on your sheet of paper right underneath John 15.1. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. A cistern is a bathtub. That's kind of just what I think of it. it, it it's a bathtub with no plumbing. Okay, It's a bird bath. That's a better, better thought. It's a bird bath. How do bird baths fill up? Well, unless you're nice and you fill it up, but rain. Okay? And so a cistern is handmade, and it only collects the rain. It does not have a source of water. And here God is saying that I'm a fountain of life. And instead of abiding in me, the fountain of life, you have carved for yourself a cistern. And he says it's a broken cistern which pretty much is worthless. It's just going to leak. It, it doesn't even hold water. I mean, it would have to be a downflow, and then it would just break. And there's this thing of human understanding and reasoning that we've just been talking about that we're actually told to stop. It's a broken cistern. It does not hold water. And for someone like me, who actually I'm very, like, think, reason, it's going around a lot, I want to understand... I have to stop myself and go, okay, God, I will lean not unto my understanding. I acknowledge you, Lord, and you direct my path. I'm asking you, Lord, I come into agreement with your word that you lead, guide, and direct well. And this is the biggest thing, the biggest. I'm like not understating or overstating that. It is the biggest. We have to agree with who he is. Who the word of God says he is. We have to. Julie, when you were saying about love, that love is patient. God's patient. Love is kind. God's kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. It's, it's, it's who he is. It's who he is. So when we're in a situation... And we don't understand what's going on, and it doesn't feel right, and our mind starts telling us, it, it starts uh, to point our finger at ourselves, point our finger at others, point our finger at God. What's up here? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you moving? We have to stop. Okay, Holy Spirit, what's the truth here? The truth is the word. What does your word say? If God be for me, who can be against me? That's right. Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. God is on my side. He delights in me. He delights in me. His hand is not too short. His arm is not too short. Lord, your arm is not too short. You, even in this... Your heart is to move. Your desire is to see this. And there's some things actually, you know, that happen in our life that can't unhappen. You know, the Lord can fix it. He can move in it. There's some things that he can just turn it around and just it's, it's even better than it was before. There's other things that just can't unhappen. It's never going to be like it was before. But God can restore a broken heart. He can bind up a wound. He can, he can like with Job is a perfect example. And we're going to talk about Job later on. But he lost those children. They're gone. And the Lord restored to him more. But the children were still gone. You know what I'm saying? Yes, they were. It was restored even more. But the children are still gone. But Jesus comes in and he heals and he 
He heals what is not naturally could ever be healed. He just recently, um, someone was sharing with me that had lost a child, was sharing about how the Lord just gave them supernatural peace in that situation. Supernatural peace. They're like, not, not. In the natural, impossible. But with God, the impossible is made possible. So we begin to agree with these things. Um, Go to where it says power of agreement. Yeah. I just shared that with Marilyn this morning Mm. um, about the loss of my daughter. Yeah. And uh, how God just took that fear away from me to be able to have another child. Yeah. Um, wow. Because the doctors couldn't guarantee that it wouldn't happen again because yeah. it was a horrible death. And uh, wow. Marilyn and the Bible study ladies laid their hands on me to give me faith to get pregnant again mm-hmm. without fear. Yeah. And I have the most amazing son wow. that God gave me. You know, and he didn't replace a child. No. no. Shandy's still gone. Right. But Daniel is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it wouldn't have happened. Wow. Without Letting go of that fear. That yes. Fear. And believing wow. and trusting in and, and that is not natural no, to be not. able to do that. That's mm-hmm. supernatural. Yeah, and well, that's when we step up and we go, everything in my emotions and everything in my thoughts says, this is impossible. It was. Mm-hmm. Everything. Mm-hmm. And then we go, but God, you're good. Mm-hmm. See, that's what's important. That's right. The leper comes to Jesus. He says, if you're willing, you can heal me. He knew. He had heard the stories. He had heard it over and over. He knew he was able. But he didn't know Jesus' heart. That Jesus actually wanted to. That's it right there. Mm -hmm. And when he knew his heart, I am willing. Be made whole. When he knew his heart, he was able to receive his promises, his goodness. So we go running after the promises of God without connecting with his heart. The enemy can be there. Our own flesh can be there. People can be there. And talking us out of believing. Yeah. Talking us out of receiving. But when we know he's good, because we've spent time with him, and we've talked to him, this is the the last two weeks, what I've been talking about, and we've abided with him, God, you're good, I know you're good, you're always good. You were good then, you'll be good now. Your nature is to restore, your nature is to love, your nature is to mend. That's your nature, God. You love that person more than I do. Your plans for them are bigger and better than I could even come up with. And we stir this up in us. Then it awakens that ability in us to grab the promises. Amen. That's right. That's who he is. It, it empowers us. To grab all. And and I'm not just talking about a healing. I'm not just talking about a financial situation. I'm talking about peace. And I'm talking about joy. Where we're not just coasting through this life. Trying to get from one day to the next. And not have a meltdown. But we're actually walking in the joy of the Lord. The expectation of God. He has good. He's for me. He's not against me. He has an awesome plan. He has an awesome purpose. He is good. And good means good. He is good. In Matthew 18, oh, does someone have something? Yeah, Pat. Uh, so I, I'm thinking this. You know, I know I've been in the reasonings, but I think God wants, he says without faith it's impossible to please him. Mm-hmm. And so because I love him, I'm... I want to show my love by trusting him. And That's good. Him. And, 
know, whatever is going on, yeah. my number one thing, I think, needs to be that I love him and believe you, him. You trust person. him, yeah. That's good. I like that. Wow. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Again, I say that if two of you agree, agree on earth concerning anything that you ask, it will be done by my Father in heaven. For when two or three are gathered in my name, they there are. There I am in the midst of them. There's this, there's this um, spiritual principle of agreement. It's huge. And um, what we agree with, we strengthen. I was talking to Fred about this. Like, Lord, just telling me this. And, and I said, you know, what we agree with, we give power to. And he says, I go, what? And he, <laughs> Fred's, Fred's uh, not like me. Fred's chill. And he just listens and stuff. And so then I say to him, what do you think about that? He's like, yeah. He goes, I kind of like the word strengthen. I'm like, I like that word too. What we agree with, we strengthen that thing. Okay? So, if I agree with the excuse of why I walk in fear in certain situations, because this happened and this happened and this happened, and in the natural... I have complete right to, right? Perfect example. I ran a red light. I drove straight into a car. I totaled my car. I totaled that car. Praise the Lord. No one was badly hurt. And we all walked away from it. Okay? I was a basket case for the next six months every time I drove through a intersection. I mean, my kids had to control themselves. To not laugh because I would just like slow down like a lot, you know, okay. And my excuse was what? That was traumatic, okay. And I would be like, don't give me a hard time because I have every reason <laughs> to feel this way. You guys, I did in the natural. Yeah. Right? But what was I doing? I was strengthening it in my life. I was giving it power that I have the right to walk in fear. I literally didn't drive. I drove very, very little for the next month or so. And I knew that wasn't okay, but I was just giving, you know, it's like, I know this isn't right, but oh well. <laughs> I do. Hi, Paul. I love you. Do we ever do that? I know this isn't all right, but I really don't feel like fighting it right now. <laughs> no, 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 right? I shouldn't say this, but. But, yeah. <laughs> but I had to, I had to start taking authority over that thing. No, I do not walk in fear. No, I have peace. Father, you help me be alert. You help me be, you know, help me w drive safely. You know, all those things. I had to step up and start agreeing with the word. Thank you, Father. And then I started to thank him. Thank you, Lord. You put your angels around about us. Even when I'm stupid and, and unaware, your angels were there even then. Your protection was there even then. Um, it literally should have not been okay. I, I did not break at all. The first I saw this car was as I was driving into him going 35 miles per hour into the side of them. It should not have been okay. So instead of me agreeing with fear, I had to come into agreement with, no, your angels are around about us. I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. I have the peace of God. I see and I know and I'm alert. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We have to come into agreement with God's word and break agreement with the lies, with the excuses, and with the reasonings. We have to. And when it comes to the goodness of God and you truly believing it, you've got to break agreement with the lies and the reasonings and the excuses. Even when they're just tiny, That's just good. little. Amen. Yeah. Well, and if we read that right, fear is a spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's not the spirit we want to have. No. No. So 
remember that, that it's not coming yeah. from the Holy Spirit. No. No, absolutely. That's right. That's right. So, there's this agreement. First uh, John five fourteen through 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, and what you actually could say there is, if we ask anything and we're in agreement with him, we're in agreement with him. God. How do we know his will? His word is his will. His word is his will. We need to be feeding on his word to know his will. Now, when it comes to things like, well, yeah, but I don't know if I should take this job or that job, or I don't know if I should buy this car or that car. Well, that's not in the Bible, but what is in the Bible? That if we ask for wisdom, he'll give it to us. That we listen and we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So those are the things I come into agreement with. I'm not sure what I should do here, but I thank you, Holy Spirit, that I hear your voice. And that you said in James that if I ask for wisdom, you would give it and you do not hold it back. We come into agreement with what we do know the word says. And then he directs our heart in the things that, you know what I'm saying, that aren't like written in there. Um, coming into agreement. John fifteen seven. We've read this one already. Our, uh, if you abide in me, this is Jesus, and my words abide in you. If you if you got my word in you, ask what you desire, and it shall be done. He's the word. Yeah, and why why is it that we need His word in us? Because when we have our when he when we have his word in us, we're going to ask right. That's right. Right? When we have his word in us, we're not going to pray, Lord, get them. We're going to pray, Lord, save them. Mercy, grace, compassion. We're going to pray right when we have the word of God in us rightly. Um, James 4.7 Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I like this verse, and it seems kind of out of place that I just pulled it up, but submitting to God is actually agreeing with him. <coughs> and we submit to him by agreeing in what we're talking about with his character, with his nature. We submit to God by agreeing with who he's told us he is. I don't know what's going on right now, but I know you're good. I'm settling this. Again, Lord, you're faithful. You are a good God. You have a good plan. You said that you know the plans that you have for us. They're to prosper us and not to harm us. That's what I agree with. I agree with you. I'm submitting to God. I'm resisting the devil. I like to just tell him no. But the main way we're going to resist the devil is by the word of God. That's what Jesus did, right? When he was in the wilderness. This is what it says. This is what it says. We resist the fear. We resist the lie. We resist questioning God's character with the word about his character. Did you guys get that? That's good. When the enemy tries to come to us and say, well, you know, but you never know, and he may want, and he might allow, and then we're like, this is what the word of God says. And when we go right now, if, if our brain just went blank on what the word of God says, in those situations, we need to get the word of God in us. We need to be digging in. It is a lifeline. It is what we fall onto. It is what we cling to. It is, okay, God, this is what you said. This is what I believe. The Lord has spoken to me through his word 
and then little, little things that he's told me about specific people in my life. And when I have a reason in the natural that looks different than that, or it's just make-believe, it's just the enemy trying to come into my mind, say, well, this is going on, and that's going on, and that's going on, or what if, what if, what if. I pull on those things. I pull on, Lord, you said you would complete the work that you began. You said that, Lord. I believe you. I believe that you're on the job. I believe you care about them more than I do. I believe your heart is for them. I believe you are not letting up. You are not letting go. I believe. I agree with you. We have to fight for this. And as we fight for it, it becomes more and more our default. It becomes more and more what we fall to. Instead of us becoming that extra large basket case, right? And then we're like, oh, yeah, I need help. We jump into this. We're like, no, 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 no. This is the truth. I agree with you. There is power in our agreement. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Um, I just heard this this week, and I liked it so much, I, 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 and it fits in here. But um, 1 Peter, so this is Peter speaking, right? Peter, the disciple, Peter the apostle, okay? And he's instructing, and he says, humble yourself. That's the same thing as submit. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So I want us to dissect this. Humble yourself. Agree with God. It's a, it's a humbling. It is. But I really want to say this, this, and this. I really want to justify why I just acted the way I did. I really want to give reason for why I'm being a control freak right now. Do y'all, do y'all associate with this? Yeah. I really want to. And the Lord, I mean, I'm telling you what, the Lord's like, stop. Don't. Just stop. Why? Because I'm agreeing with it then. I'm strengthening it in my life. In these situations, this, this, and this, I'm allowed to be crazy. I'm giving it strength. Okay, so I have to humble myself and go, okay, God, I'm saying what you say. I'm walking in love here. I don't have to justify myself. If that person thinks that, that's in between them and you. Under the mighty hand of God, he'll exalt you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to work it out in due time. Casting, circle the word casting, focus on it. Casting. All your cares, and when I, when, I, when I thought of the word cares, I thought of your thoughts, your figurings, your trying. Cast all that on me. Why? Because I care for you. If we don't know that, it's really hard to do the humbling and the casting. If we don't know, he really cares about us. He's really tender-hearted and compassionate towards us. He really, really loves us. So, Peter uses the word casting. What do you all think of that? What do you think of? Peter, the fisherman, uses the word casting. Okay? That's an interesting word. And you think of two places automatically in the word Um, Jesus, it's when he first called Peter, and he says, hey, have you caught any fish? Like, nope, nope, haven't caught a thing. Well, go out to the deep and cast over your net. And what did Peter say? He says, we have fished all night long, and we have caught nothing. But... Because you say so, which makes no sense at all. But because you say so, it's totally against every fish, fisherman's rule. But because you say so, 
Because you say so, I'll forgive. Because you say so, I'm going to keep my mouth shut right now. Because you say so, I'm going to give even more into the situation that does not deserve it. Because you say so, I'm going to not let my mind go there again. Because you say so, I'm going to do it. The other place that I thought of where Peter would have been told by the Lord to cast his net was after the resurrection. And Peter had gone back to fishing because Peter was sad. He messed up. He denied the Lord. He did not do well, right? right? So he's like, I'm going back fishing. He's fishing with the other disciples. They're not catching anything. And then Jesus is like, hey, friends, have you caught anything? No. Throw it on the other side. So they're like, okay, and they do, and this this hull comes in, and then Peter's like, oh, it's him. It's him. How sweet is the Lord. And so then you have Peter, who was called by the Lord in that situation. You have Peter that was reconciled to the Lord in that situation. He uses this word. He says, cast. Cast your care over on the Lord. Make a choice. It doesn't make sense. We fished all night. What does the right side have to do any different than the left? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right that we're supposed to pray for those who hurt us. That doesn't seem right. I like to pray for my people. I don't want to pray for the people that hurt me, right? But man, when we humble ourselves, when we agree with God, the God of love, the God of mercy, the God that's on our side. See, that's when we can trust him and do what he says. When we know that, I agree with him. Okay, I'm going to do that, Lord. And I have seen the Lord turn my heart around. I've seen him turn situations around just by obedience and agreement with his word. Cast is kind of like get rid of it, throw it, you know. Yeah, get rid of it. yeah. cast it. it. Get rid of it. Throw yeah, it. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. It's a force. There's a force in mm-hmm. cast, right? You can't partially cast right. You're that's either all in or you're out. That's, that's, true. that's, that's true. good. That's, that's good. Really that's that is. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? Cast it all. Yeah. I just remember as you were talking, because you were here, it seemed to be related to some like relationships. But I remember when, when uh, in this in the situation, and this would not work for non-believing people, but God says, trust my spirit in them. Mm-hmm. Trust my spirit mm-hmm. working for yeah. them. And so that kind of even can change your prayer. Yeah. And we're supposed to be specific. And yeah, that. yeah. I actually had the Lord tell me that one time when I was praying for a, a guy that I was really upset with and um, thought I needed to go straighten him out. It was not my, any of my children. It was something somebody had done to one of my kids. And um, the Lord said, um, be confident of my Holy Spirit within them. Because they know them. They know the Lord. They wanted to follow the Lord. And that became something that I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm confident of your Holy Spirit within that person. All right. We are going to um, wrap this up. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly finish this because uh, we've got the time. Y'all are here, right? We're here. So, um, Peter, <clears throat> Peter's awesome. How much do we love Peter? You know, lots of times we love Peter because Peter's so real. Like, he yeah. just messed up all the time with his mouth. He's just great. Uh, but you know what? A lot of the disciples messed up, not just Peter. And Peter was the cool one who got out of the boat and got on the water while all of them sat in the boat, you know. Peter was awesome. But Peter had this really um, wrong way of thinking. Peter had more confidence in Peter than he had in Jesus. And we see this when Jesus is telling him, that he's going to deny him. And Peter's like, I will never deny you, ever. And you know what? I really think Peter meant it. 
Like he had that sword. He was striking the ear off that guy. He was there. He was ready. But as we well know, in the end, Peter did deny the Lord three times. And so Peter had this, um, in his immaturity, he had more confidence in his commitment to the Lord than he did the Lord's commitment to him. And it, it's a real, it's a real uh, thing in talking about humbling ourselves, humbling ourselves. Okay, God, I can't do this, but you can. Holy Spirit, empower me, and I agree with your word. There's a lot of humility there, a lot. And Peter was just like so many of us can be. This is what I'm going to do. This is, this is, I will never deny you. I will never do that, which of course we're instructed, don't do that. Don't ever think that of yourself. But it's so sweet because in John 21, 15 through 17, right after um, this whole thing happened where they casted the net on the other side, the fish came in, Peter's great. He's like, oh, it's the Lord. <laughs> it's not just... You guys, just like, that's real. That happened. He was in a boat. He just realized that's Jesus. And he dives in and swims to the Lord. I love his heart for the Lord. And so Jesus is making breakfast. He's got fish cooking, you know. And we know that this is when Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my lambs. In other words, don't go fishing. Do what I told you to do. Even though you messed up. Even though you messed up. Do what I told you to do. He says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He says to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He says to him, tend my sheep. He says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Jesus was grieved because he had asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, now get what he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, Jesus asked him, and it's cool, I've heard people say, you know, for the three denials, Jesus gave him three opportunities to confess his love for him, and that's awesome. The biggest thing here, though, is Jesus didn't need to hear Simon <coughs> saying, I love you. Peter, Peter, Peter needed to hear that's right. him say, Lord, I love you. And the last time, this is what's so cool, is he's like, I agree with you, God. You know all things. You know all things. You know my heart. You know this is real. Even in my immaturity, even in my failure, even in my questioning of your goodness, even in my questioning of your, your faithfulness to my children and my husband and my health and my finances, even in that, God, you know this is the truth. You love me, and I love you. There's this confidence that's built in that agreement. You love me, and I love you. So not only do I know that God's good, but I know he looks at me, and he sees, oh, there's one that loves me. She loves me, even in her weakness, even in her mistakes. She loves me. Now, when we look at John, and John's awesome... John, now I want to set this up real quick, and then we're going to wrap this up. But John was not perfect. We think of John as being really good. You know, he was Jesus' favorite, right? Yeah. So John said so. He must be. But, but we think of John as just having his act together, and he did not. John wanted to call down lightning and fire on a city not far before this. He had a spirit of murder on him that he wanted to torch a city. 
John was one of them who wanted to rule over everybody for all eternity, forever. He asked for it. He asked to be like Jesus' second-hand man and rule over everybody. John did not have his act together. He was one of them who fled from the garden also. But what's so cool is you see John four times in the Gospel of John. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it became his identity was God's love for him. His identity became God's love for him. Instead of being confident, no, I will never deny you. I will never do that. He became confident in Jesus and his love for him. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. John 21, 20, then Peter turned around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Peter didn't say this. John said it about himself, who also had leaned on the Lord at the supper. We talked about this, I think, last week or the week before. John leaned upon Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. He was close to his heart. So close that when Jesus said, someone's going to deny me, the others were like, ask him who? Ask him who? Like, is it me? Could you ask him? And John was the one that had the confidence, said, who is it? He had the confidence. He's like, who is it, Jesus? There is this confidence that we gain in our love for the Lord when we understand his love for us. When we agree with God's love for us, it implants in us this confidence that I do love you. Even in my weakness, even in my failures, even when I want to call down fire on that person. Later on, I'm like, okay, Lord, yeah, I repent of that. Father, I do love you because you're good, because you're faithful. I'm not cowering in the corner. I'm not afraid of the Father. I am holding his hand. I'm in agreement with him because I know he's good. So I gave you guys some verses there that kind of is a a good combination of how he feels about us, how we feel about him, who he is in our life, who we are to him. And I am, I am imploring you girls, focus on this. Focus on it. Like, don't just come here and go, oh, that's so good. I love when Carrie cries when she talks about Jesus. <laughs> she says all that neat stuff. Like, this is the pearl of great price. Yes, is. This is what we go after. God, you're good. And good does mean good, God. I'm not, I'm not going to try to figure out this situation because that doesn't look good. I know you're good. And if this situation isn't good, you're going to make it good. You're going to move in it. You're going to do whatever you can do. Whatever we allow you to do. Do you know God will go as far as we allow him to go? Right. In our hearts, in our situations, what other people do. Um, He presses in. He has such grace, such mercy, such love. He has so much for us when we allow him that space, when we're like, God, you are good. I know you can. Tell me your heart, Lord. My heart is that I am willing. Okay, I take it. That's his heart. His heart is for us. All right, anyone got anything? Any questions, any comments? Yeah. I might give you just a, this is just an example of.